I hope you all are doing great during this uh, tumultuous time. My name is Fayaz Nawabi, and I serve as the Policy and Advocacy Manager at the Council on American Islamic Relations LA office. And with me are two wonderful people that have been working uh, firsthand, ground zero on making sure that we evacuate as many of our Afghan uh, community members as possible. And I will allow them to introduce themselves. Hi, good evening. My name is Brittany Reze. I'm a managing attorney with CARE San Francisco Bay Area. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Boshmi Nasiri, and I'm a private immigration attorney um, in Pleasanton, California, and I'm also a loving family member of the CARE family. Thank you all for introducing yourself. Once again, my name is Fayaz, and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Manager at CARE LA. I want to thank everyone that joined us on Zoom and those that are watching us at the various CARE chapters throughout California on Facebook Live. Again, we are, you know, our hearts are going out to many of the families that are right now stranded in Afghanistan. Uh, so we're going to go step by step, inshallah ta'ala, uh, to educate and inform the community on what we can do to alleviate the concerns of many of our community members. So I wanted to just take a step back and really emphasizing how this all started. We know that the Afghan, uh, the U.S. decided to pull troops out of Afghanistan, and we know what happened. Uh, you all are watching the news, and you know what's going on right now in Kabul. Uh, so what I'm trying to do, inshallah ta'ala, is really laying down the groundwork of what we can do, inshallah ta'ala, to help as many of our community members as possible. Right now, there's a volatile situation in Kabul, especially at the Kabul airport. Uh, many of you that are watching this webinar and watching this on Facebook Live have family members or friends that are right now stranded at Kabul. I personally have family members and friends also uh, stranded either in the airport or outside of the airport of Kabul. Uh, the situation is uh, very hectic and uncoordinated right now. Uh, many members are being asked to fill out various forms and they're getting emails from the State Department to come to certain gates uh, at the Kabul airport. And Sister Spojme will go in more details on how that process looks and what she's seeing from clients and hearing from clients that are on ground zero at those different gates and, and at the Kabul airport. So Sister Spojme, do you want to tell the community on uh, the community members that are watching the webinar what to expect and what are the checklists for them and their family to get through this process? Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Sorry, I was muted. So um, as an immigration practitioner, I have dozens and dozens of clients who are, um, cases are either processing at the National Visa Center or they had the interview and they were waiting to get the visa at the State Department, I mean, at the U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan. Um, the situation is, is that um, a few days ago, there was a form called the repatriation form that was amended to be filed for anybody who has a case that's documentarily ready from the NBC or at the site. So everybody has been filling that form out and they're getting this visa, uh, an email with the visa on it to go to the gate. So unfortunately, thousands and thousands of people are getting those, even though they are not um, potentially eligible for that. Uh, we also have many, many of my own clients who are lawful permanent residents and even U.S. citizens. And as, uh, as was just mentioned, uh, Fayaz John just said that his own father, who's a U.S. citizen, can't get in. So the situation right now is very dangerous, very chaotic, and very unpredictable. So if you have your loved ones, I'm consistently hearing from people saying, I don't want to send my family there. Um, what's going to happen? Unfortunately, as, as harsh as the sound, people are gonna have to take that risk to try to get their family if they got that visa letter. One of the things we're trying to do is to, um, people are saying, you know, if I have family members that didn't get it, can I, can I take them? A word of caution is you can take them if you want. There's no guarantee that they will be able to get through. So we've heard of, you know, stampedes. We've heard of people being, you know, 
crushed. We've heard of people, their telephones and their documentation stolen. So there is a document that was shared by, uh, by someone here and the documents, what we're seeing is if you're, docu- if you're carrying your documents, like your passport, your tasquera, um, your, your, even your green card or any of those documents, you should have in a secure place on yourself because we are hearing people being robbed, their documents being taken. Um, being the culture that we are, um, you know, it's more safe maybe for a woman to have the documents if you're carrying, traveling with a female, they're less likely to search them for those documentations. So what you wanna do is you wanna carry, you know, photos of your passport and, or your tasquera um, and any other government ID you may have. Um, and then, uh, you know, work that you did on behalf of the US or international. So if you're coming into the SIV, any documents or anything you have, you want to be very careful that you have them secure, sewed on. Um, but most of the documents that you need to carry on you with is your the email that you get with the visa letter because nobody's getting through without that visa letter. Although in country, thousands and thousands of people are getting that letter. That's a ticket that gets you into the gates in order to process the rest of the case. I have personally heard from other colleagues um, that some people who didn't even have a you know a petition or anything they got they filled out that repatriation form that has been posted and they have been able to get through so so again with the caution like it was said there's you know extreme um caution and then there are risks we've had a client for example who's been trying so he was issued the visa of a u.s citizen to go to the airport and he's already been turned away three times two times he's been beaten not only by the crowd but also the taliban so the situation is chaotic, it's unpredictable, it's constantly changing. Uh, Fayaz will talk about later what legislative issues we're trying to do to somehow ease that tension over there. So if you do have family members, please caution them. But unless you take that risk, it's not gonna go anywhere. And keep in mind, the US is not gonna go escort anyone. They're not allowed, they're only at the gate. The rest of the area, the Taliban, they're trying to negotiate maybe further out to be able to escort people. And that's all process that's continuously changing. Thank you for the update, Sister Spojme. Now we're going to be going to uh, Brittany, and she's going to give us an update on the humanitarian parole process and other processes. Thank you. So, um, yes, I want to talk to you about the other options that are out there for folks. So um, the first one I want to talk about is the special immigrant visa or the SIV. So this is a type of visa for Afghans that have been employed for at least one year with the U.S. government. Um, And it needs to have been between 2001 and 2023. Um, They also need to have shown that they experienced, are experiencing an ongoing threat of harm or as a consequence of their employment. Um, Those who are eligible for it and have not yet applied, please do so as soon as possible. Um, And they should send their their application in. Um, There's also an expedited they can send their application to the National Visa Center directly as well, in addition to, to following the normal channels to facilitate processing it in a, an expedited manner. Um, I'm going to share with you a link when I'm done talking as well that um, has links to the email address and things that in places that you can uh, additional resources for where you can send those applications. Um, if someone has already ha- been approved for their SIV um, application, they should contact the, their congressional office to seek immediate evacuation. We've also shared some resources of other of congressional offices that are supporting evacuation. So you can reach out outside of your district, but otherwise um, it, you're encouraged um, if it's a family member or friend um, to, to reach out in, in your district where you live. So if you live in San Jose, to reach out to Zoe Lofgren, who is the congressional representative there. Um, if you're um, advocating on behalf of a, a particular individual. Otherwise, um, we've shared some resources for congressional offices that are, are also um, trying to help evacuate people. Um, there's also an email with the State Department where people can, can contact, um, which is on the resource page I will share as well if they have a, an approved SIV application. Um, I, and we also have some, uh, some more resources on where to find the details of what, to, what documents you need to apply for SIV visa. Um, the, the second program to mention for it, this is for individuals who um, Afghan P2, P2 program, which is a new program introduced. Uh, it's specifically for Afghan nationals to be considered through the refugee resettlement process 
who have worked for US government agencies, US-based NGOs, or US-based media organizations who might not qualify for the SIV. So maybe they worked for less than a year or something like that. Um, this is just a different process than the SIV process. Um, rather, the P2 process goes through refugee resettlement processing, which is a different agency than the, the State Department. Um, and this program doesn't accept self-referral, so you can't just apply for it on your own. Rather, um, the head of whichever company, whichever US-based company you worked for, the head of that company needs to be the one to make the application for you or the most senior person in that company. Um, they, they should fill out the application and submit it on your behalf. Um, the, we, we have some more resources, but some more details and information to, if you are specifically looking into provide to um, su submitting one of those applications. The other options that folks might have to immigrate to the United States is through, through relatives. Um, so suppose we mentioned some of the options for people who have applications already pending. If you don't, if you're, if you're interested in applying for relatives, um, US citizens and lawful permanent residents can, can apply for certain, um, certain relatives depending on their category. Many of these processes take months, most of them take years, um, but it's, great time, you know, you can get the process started as soon as possible. Um, that is through the applying through USCIS, a US Immigration and Citizenship Program with the form called I-130, also link in the resource page. Um, and current refugees or asylees here in the United States can also petition for their children and spouses um, through a process with USCIS um, in a form called the I-730, also in the resource page. Um, so again, those, those processes take years, uh, but worth it to start right now if that's something that you wanna pursue. Um, the, the way to expedite those processes potentially, or even in cases where people haven't, haven't filed one of those applications is through a humanitarian parole request. I, mean, I imagine many people have heard about that recently. So humanitarian parole is a process by which you can ask either um, USCIS, um, US Customs and Immigration Services, or, or CBP, Customs and Border Protection, agencies of the United States, um, to allow someone into the United States who's seeking either to come here temporarily for an urgent humanitarian, humanitarian region, reason, or because they have, um, they plan to regularize, regularize their status in the United States. So they're, they have a family petition uh, pending, or they're gonna file a family petition, um, or they haven't tend to apply for asylum or something like that. Um, we imagine that immigration is going to be inundated and be given just hundreds and thousands of these applications. So it's really important that if you do submit one, it, it provides as much compelling evidence as possible for why you in particular need, have an urgent humanitarian reason to come here to the United States. So if there's a health reason, um, anything in addition to add about why you might be targeted Really important to include that in there. Um, we'll, we'll talk about it in a bit, but there are attorneys around the country eager and willing to help um, and wanting to help folks. So please, um, you know, do reach out and try to get legal help if you want to pursue um, humanitarian parole because it is a difficult application to fill and requires a lot of documents. Um, to apply for human, humanitarian parole, you do need to go to a third country um, and. Oftentimes, uh, getting resettling to the United States for someone is not going to be the quickest option for anyone that's in danger um, in Afghanistan at this moment, unless they already have an application approved or you know they're a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident. It's very hard to get here quickly. Um, so oftentimes, the safest thing for someone is going to be to go to a third country, and in that third country. Um, there, we have, a, we have a list also of, of countries that you may be able, the Afghan people may be able to travel to without getting a visa. Um, but in that third country, they could either seek humanitarian parole at the con US consulate or um, go to a um, refugee resettlement site, um, whether it's run by the United Nations or another agency and um, go through the refugee process. So in order to, to seek refuge or to become a refugee in the United States or seek humanitarian parole, it is necessary to get to a third country um, and get out of Afghanistan. If that is really, if you're you know, really in danger right at this moment, 
safest thing is to, to get out um, if you can safely and not to, to just wait to, to come to the United States because it really, um, the consulates is operating out of the airport. <laughs> Essentially, it is shut down um, and it's gonna be very hard to do anything there on the ground, um, starting from scratch. Uh, the other thing I just wanna mention uh, for anyone who's here in the United States already, or who might be traveling here or might, who might make it here to the United States directly, um, you can seek asylum. Um, so if you come here on a visitor visa or some, some other type of visa, or you're ready here and you're afraid to return to, asi to um, Afghanistan, please seek counsel to a, um, with an immigration attorney who can advise on, on your individual case of whether or not you would be eligible for asylum. Um, and this is for individuals who fear that they, um, that the, they will be seriously harmed by the Taliban or any other group um, and that the government in Afghanistan is not able to protect them because of their race and that they'll be targeted because of their race, nationality, religion, their political opinion or membership in a particular social group. Um, and and the, these folks, you know, if you're in Afghanistan, safest thing might be to seek refuge in a, a third country. You come to the United States or you're already here, please speak to an immigration attorney who can advise you on that further on that process. Um, suppose you me to have anything else to add on that? So, um, yeah, thank you. you. You covered it very well. I just wanted to add that the component of the calls that I'm getting, uh, you know, literally three, 400 calls we're getting. I'm trying to stay up on top as much as I can. Most people are calling about the P2. As you mentioned, I just want to reiterate, um, the P is like a three category. And this was a program that was started a long time ago, maybe by Obama or someone else that was utilized in Syria. And it didn't really, it wasn't as successful as all we hoped because the challenges and barriers are real. P1 is for those who are eligible for the special immigrant visas because they were translators, but for some reason they don't meet the one year requirement. You still have to meet the other requirement to get uh, the letter from your superior. Well, we all know the US is gone. Who are you gonna get the letter from? And also for P2, which is the NGO, the not if you work for an NGO, if you work for a nonprofit, again, you could not have been a volunteer you could not have been a subcontractor. And if you were an employee, the highest level person in that company had or nonprofit has to file it for you. The challenges I'm hearing is, well, they're gone. I can't get a hold of them. The third component, again, is the, the family uh, reunification. It's a term of art that nobody knows what it means. As we're speaking, the American Immigration Lawyers Association is trying to get clarification for what family reunification means. And again, you know, people are saying, I want to file it. Well, you can't file the P1. It's a, I mean, you can do it. You have to have all the documentation. P2, you cannot file. The organization has to file it on your behalf. If you want to do the P3, that's fine. But in all those three categories, the biggest obstacle still is as of now, and, and the American Immigration Lawyers Association will get into it is advocating to change some of the requirements because you can file it in Afghanistan, but you have to leave to a third country to continue the process and you have to register with the UNHCR. So the obstacle, nobody's getting out. There's no flights going. So USCIS just threw something blanket out there, but it's not realistic for most people. So I'm getting inundated with, with hundreds of calls. I want to do P2, I want to do P1, I want to do P3. Um, right now, I mean, you can do it, but you have to get yourself to a third country. So I just want to kind of pinpoint on the P program. Um, and just one last thing to mention as well is that um, the International Refugee Assistance Project, IRAP, is um, the leading organization supporting individuals seeking SIVs or P2 visas. So I encourage you to review their resources or re contact them if you have any questions. Um, and then also Pars Equality Center is um, helping mobilize and volunteer attorneys to support individuals seeking humanitarian parole. Um, so I also sent a link to their, um, web, their web form if you're interested in seeking assistance in, with humanitarian parole. Uh, thank you, Brittany, and thank you, uh, Spojme. Uh, again, we want to emphasize the importance of, you know, filling out those repatriation forms, fill out all the documents. Please do not go, please emphasize to your family and friends that are in Kabul, in the outside of the airport, you can't go to the airport without filling out those forms. The only way you can get to the airport is when you fill out the forms, 
your family members and friends will receive an email from the state department. And then they'll tell you, okay, come to the gate at this specific gate at this certain time. So these, these situations are still developing. I know my family's currently going through it and we're getting several calls and trying to help community members go through this process. Again, for those individuals that are going to be going through the checkpoints of the Taliban and then getting to the gates, make sure you have multiple copies of your documents. Do not lose them. We're hearing cases of the Taliban looking at someone's document and if they feel it's fake, they rip it in front of them. So you do not want to be stuck in that situation where you have your original documents ripped up. The other thing that Sister Spojme mentioned earlier, there are some cases where folks fill out the repatriation form and they were able to get through the air, uh, international uh, airport checkpoint and through the gate with their whole family, even though they didn't fill out the documents for their whole family. However, at the same time, there are uh, cases wherein a person tried to do the same thing but they were not allowed to go through the gate except the individual that filled out the repatriation form. So they went there with their wife and child. The wife and child was left and they were only allowed to get through. So if you are going to be doing this, this is very risky, very dangerous, because again, there are stampedes happening at those various gates. We want to make sure that everyone is safe and sound through this whole process. Please follow the steps. Make sure you fill out the forms wait for the email from the State Department, and then follow the instructions that the State Department gives. Finally, I'm gonna be going through a portion of the policy aspect of what CARE California and CARE in general is doing to support the Afghan community during this tumultuous time. We are meeting with many members of uh, the House of Representatives. We also meeting with uh, US senators also throughout the entire country. Just today, I had a meeting with uh, Senator Feinstein Thank you, Dr. Saradin and the individual group that helped make that a reality with their staff. Uh, and we updated them on what is happening. So far, what the House and the Senate has done, the House created a, a caucus, the you know o Honoring Our Promises Caucus, which is basically a caucus formed specifically for what's happening in Afghanistan. Over 48 members of the House of Representatives have joined that caucus, and they've already sent a letter to the president's uh, administration demanding that the refugee cap be increased for the Afghan refugees that are going to be increasing in number. And they're also emphasizing the importance of evacuating those that are gonna be receiving those SIVs that have worked with the US government, that have worked uh, in the various embassy, in the embassy in Afghanistan, and making sure that we also evacuate activists that were on the ground in Afghanistan during this past 20 years. So that's what the House is doing. The Senate just sent out a letter also with about 42 members of the U.S. Senate emphasizing the same thing. But in addition to those uh, issues that they're emphasizing, they also emphasize the importance of evacuating ethnic minorities from the Hazara community, from the Shiite community that have been historically uh, persecuted by the Taliban, uh, especially in the 90s. So again, these are just some of the things that's happening at the House and the Senate. Uh, right now, there's conversations about introducing a bill to make th these demands, uh, actualize these demands in both in the House and the Senate. There's uh, two companion bills about to be introduced. We will update the community as soon as the bill gets a name and a number. Uh, the conversation and the letter and the writing of the bill is still being worked through. And inshallah ta'ala, as soon as those bills are ready, uh, we will definitely update the community and make sure that we get our community members to contact their representatives to make sure that they either co-sponsor the bill or vote on these uh, specific bills, inshallah ta'ala. With that being said, I know we have many uh, questions coming up. We're not in the Q&A section yet, uh, but I'm going to go back to Sister Spojme. She's going to be talking about a little bit about AILA, a wonderful organization that's doing great work around this uh, situation that's happening in Afghanistan. Thank you so much. So uh, I know we're going to get to the questions later. Um, one of the things that I wanted to go back to, and this information was just given to me maybe about 15 minutes ago prior to the call. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we are seeing people actually getting out. Now the questions are coming in. Where are they being taken? How long are they being held? What's the process? As you know, for national security reasons, we have limited. So I'm part of what's called AILA, Amer American Immigration Law Lawyers Association, along with Brittany and thousands of other immigration attorneys across the country. Um, all of this chaos unfolded Friday 
um, the American immigration owner was someone, no one, I mean, it's the weekend, rightfully. I emailed someone and I was grateful that they, they called me, the board of directors on Saturday night said, well, can you do spoke me? I said, let's kick start advocacy. The biggest thing is advocacy at the, at the highest level. Um, we had a call with like 50 lawyers on Monday. And then on Tuesday, we had 650 immigration lawyers on this call. Now, to me, that is astronomical because I want people to know as much as despair that we have as Afghans. I personally have my cousin who's a translator in Kabul. His brother's here and the other brother's there. He served with the, with the military for almost 11 years, but didn't have some papers, didn't get out. So the pain and the heartache I feel is not only as a Muslim, as an Afghan, but also people who are out there on the front. Uh, on the front line, and we know that the Taliban are going home to home uh, because the people are reporting to me and uh, clients are reporting to me. So back to the question of what's happening for the few that are lucky to get out. Um, if they're U.S. citizens and they're green card holders, I'm presuming they're being taken to Qatar pro and just processed and let in, or they're being taken to Fort Lee. So we don't know the logistics. But if your loved one is lucky enough to get out and say they were documentarily done at uh, National Visa Center or they were at the State Department, I mean, the U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan, they were done, or they got lucky, they had nothing, like uh, Brother Faya said, they had nothing, but they got in. They're being taken to Qatar, they're being processed there. Now, we're not being told what's happening, and I just asked the AILA representative about 15 minutes ago, some of the top people in AILA know the Department of Defense, are working tirelessly uh, to see what we can do and, and what, what's working going forward. But if your loved one ends up in Qatar, please understand, it'll be months before they come to the United States because they have to finish the consular processing abroad. They are not gonna allow people to come in. The medical examinations, the security checks, all of those have to be done. Now, if that process is gonna take five, six, seven months, there is something called that, you know, Brittany referred to the humanitarian parole to say, I want my family member to come here and process them here. Uh, but keep in mind that this is gonna be a long haul. There's backup and backlog in USCIS unless the State Department or DHS or USCIS takes some drastic action and says, we can't house them in Qatar for six, eight months, let them in. But I highly doubt that that would happen based on the, by what I'm hearing. So please be understanding, please be patient. Uh, again, all of us inundated are with, with the hundreds of calls. Personally, myself, I know people are angry and they want this thing because I'm an immigration lawyer, Brittany's immigration lawyer, Fayaz is connected, we have something. We are all desperately trying. So why, why the advocacy portion is important and alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm blessed for our community, everyone coming and supporting and doing the, um, going from advocacy works to reaching out to their congressmen to doing even the, the protests that I saw one in Hayward yesterday. So kudos to everyone for playing the part, but I think, um, you know, reaching out to your local congressmen, um, reaching out to your local congressmen and putting pressure. We have Eric Swalwell who's doing a great job. The largest Afghan population outside of Afghanistan is in, in Fremont, you know, and we have little Kabul. So he's doing an extraordinary job. He has a town hall tomorrow if you're interested in going. I believe it's at 12 o'clock. You can go to his website and see where it's at. Now, the advocacy, what are we doing? What, what do we want? You know, like uh, Brother Fayaz, maybe he mentioned it already, what the American Immigration Lawyer Association is to push for um, if they get sent to Qatar or they get somewhere, you know, exempt some of the tests like the DNA testing um, and then expedite the processing for asylums and expedite their interviews for asylees. People might not know, but there's a large number of Afghans here that uh, don't have legal status they're living in limbo. So what we're asking Congress to do is give temporary protective status, TPS. Cubans, I mean, there's El Salvadorians, Hondurans, Haitians. Many countries get the TPS status. We want TPS for the Afghans that are here. Uh, Brittany mentioned in detail, humanitarian parole. Now, everybody who's filling out this humanitarian parole, please do not expect the magic wand that your family is gonna get in. I know for a fact, a couple of attorneys have gotten humanitarian parole. They filed it months before. They have not been able to get their clients through the, the mayhem and the stampede that's going on in Kabul um, right now. We are also trying to provide, um, to get more coordination with the Department of Defense. To, to, to protect and, and provide some sometimes a barriers to protect those people who are coming in um, because we are hearing that people are being killed, people are being hurt. And it's heartbreaking for me. I have a personal story of a client who got that he's all done, he's ready. He's a spouse of a US citizen. He's gone three times and he's been beaten and he's been bloody and he's gone back. 
every time I have to tell him, please go back, it's like, or God forbid, something happens to him. It's like I'm his attorney. So, so that, that secondary emotional impact is really, really dire. And none of us, and including many attorneys and human rights activists, everybody, and many of you are probably daunted and not sleeping and not doing so. So that is uh, what we're trying to do. We're also trying to get, uh, for me, my one of the biggest thing is get Congress, um, as Brother Fayaz said, you know, they're doing a Congress, the Senate, see what we can pass, is maybe get a mass uh, humanitarian, uh, and, you know, intervention, maybe get some sort of refugee status to, to get like, we know I came as a child of the 1980s refugees for the Soviet war, maybe we can get something. Is it um, highly likely? I don't know. Can we be optimistic? Yes. Can we push for it? Yes. But please, if you're calling me, you're calling Brittany, you're calling other attorneys, um, the forms are there. They're time consuming. It's not something quick that's going to just fix it. Um, and there's absolutely no, right now, as disheartening as it sounded, I am sincerely sorry to say, but there's no process in place that you can bring your mother, your father, your uncle, your aunt, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives in your village. It's not going to happen. It's not there. Um, you know, for their safety, if you do decide to do for your family the P program or try to get the visa and you, they actually get it, again, I want to reiterate, the safety is number one issue. And if you want to risk it and you want to take it, please be cautious. Um, the last portion of it is we're asking um, USCIS, what does it mean for family reunification, the third prong of the T program doesn't mean it's family reunification for anybody if I have a brother a cousin a sister or does it mean if somebody who is a special immigrant translator and their families are at risk is it those people so up to date we haven't gotten it we're all working around the clock with our different organizations I personally am on the one of the persons that got put on the task force for the Afghan crisis that we have right now with Ayla. And I will try to put everything I can on my website. Uh, we're trying to share information with another. So many people are doing it. But we, I don't want to sound pessimistic. I'm just trying to give the true, correct information. Like uh, Brother Fayaz's brother is a US citizen and he's trying to get his father out. Uh, and if we can't get US citizens out and we can't get green card holders out and we can't get people that legitimately need to get out because they've already been given documents, it's going to be very difficult to get those who want to just get out. There's no huge human mass migration from Awanistan, unfortunately, right now, because there's nothing in process. So um, I will leave you with that. I, I hope that information is helpful. And then we'll continue on. Uh, Brittany, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think that was very, very comprehensive. Thank you. Okay, folks, uh, again, we are looking at a very dire situation. The consulate is at the airport. There's a lot of slowdown because of safety and security reasons at in Kabul and especially at the Kabul airport. So be, please be patient with us. I know I'm getting phone calls from around the world, not just from around the country. I've gotten phone, phone calls from folks in Germany and Italy and some of them were sending me messages in Italian and German. I don't speak those languages. So we're trying our best to help as many people as we can. So please be patient uh, with us, inshallah, Tata, during these uh, during this process. The other thing I wanted to emphasize was one of the things that we're working uh, towards and, you know, making sure that members of Congress are aware of and inshallah by that by that. They're also going to be making sure that the Biden administration is aware of this is we want to increase the refugee cap number. Currently, uh, the refugee cap in the U.S. is at 62,500 individuals. That's a that's a very low number. Alhamdulillah, it's better than the Trump administration during his last year. The refugee cap was at 15,000, if you believe that. But right now it's at 62,500. So one of the asks we're making of the Biden administration is to increase that number by another 100,000. During the evacuation of Vietnam, the refugee cap was increased by 120,000 uh, people. So inshallah ta'ala, we're making that ask. That way we get all of our families, inshallah ta'ala, those people that are SIV, uh, that are applying for the SIVs and our priority two or priority three to make sure that they get through uh, this process, inshallah ta'ala. So with that being said, we have some questions and I'm also telling folks right now on Facebook and on the webinar, if you have questions, please put your questions in the chat and we're going to 
answer those questions to the best of our abilities, inshallah ta'ana. So, um, Faiz John, just before we go to the Q&A, um, I just recall that one of the questions that was asked um, when you filled out the repatriation form, as unbelievable as it sounds, it says that at the end of it, if you recall, Brittany, that you will be required later on to pay for your ticket. You will not be able to get your green card or paperwork. One of the things we're trying to work on is to waive those fees. And not that that's something to worry about right now. We want to get our loved ones. We also, it's very much unknown when those are those people that are in Qatar, they're going to be housed in a special place. Um, who's going to pay for their cost during that time that they're there? What's going to happen to them? Where are they going to be? A lot of that is unknown. A lot of that information is not released. It's too early. And we're hoping as we get them, one of the places I know CARE has a, a great resource tool. I'm trying as a solo practitioner, um, put up information as much as I can on our law office page. Um, but there's a lot of unknowns and people just need to understand and be patient that so you could have been told something and it changes in an hour because the situation is just so chaotic right now. Okay, Jazakallah Khair. I have one question from Wahid Ghazai on the Care California Facebook uh, live stream. And the question is, if someone has documents in hand, can they be evacuated? Uh, not the COM approval. I don't know what that means at the end. Not the COM, COM approval. If someone has documents in hand, can they be evacuated? Well, I mean, everybody has documents in hand, right? We have lawful permanent residents. We have green card holders. Um, there's different questions, right? First, you got to get through the mayhem at the checkpoint. Then if you get through, you're lucky enough to get to the checkpoint, then you have to get into the U.S. Embassy where they process the documentations and then get you on a plane. Only one plane, as far as I know, was going a day out. And they may be changing that now. So to answer your question, if you have document, if your document, if you have the documents, uh, on what basis did you fill out the repatriation form just in the hopes of getting that visa letter? Because everybody's getting it. So, to answer your question, if you have that visa form that potentially may get you in, and you have all your documents, um, because of the chaos, you might get lucky and you might get processed. Like Brother Faya said earlier, there was a family, the whole family got in, right? And then there's a family that the husband got in, the children didn't. So to answer your question, I mean, if you have those two things and you're able to get through, um, more likely. Now, I'll tell you a story. My friend, a close friend of mine, that day that the Taliban came, um, everybody that was working at the airport scrambled because the U.S. military was there. He ended up on that plane and he was just a worker at the airport. And now he's in Qatar. What is he going to get eventually? Like Britain said, maybe he'll get asylum. Maybe they'll get some other form. So to answer your question, yeah, if they have documents and they do their repatriation and get that visa letter, um, there's always a chance. Okay, I haven't seen any other questions in the live streams. Um, are there any uh, frequently asked questions that yourself, Spojme, or uh, Brittany have received from the individuals calling about their family members in Afghanistan? Brittany, do you want to go? Yeah, I think I think the most common question we've seen is um, obviously uh, I imagine this question most people have is um, how can I help my mom or my brother or my sister um, uh, get out of Afghanistan or, or to become here with me? Um, and and like I mentioned earlier, this depends on well the there's like we've all mentioned, I think a few times now, there's no quick way to get a relative here, um, particularly if they're not in, in direct danger. Um, and even if they are, it's still not a, a, a quick process to happen. Um, but the processes that, that you can pursue is that if it's, it's a relative, um, depending on your um, relationship to them and your status in the United States, whether you're a permanent resident or green card holder, you may be able to petition for them as a relative. Um, U.S. citizens have priority, and in most cases, if if it's a um, what's considered an immediate relative, so like a spouse, uh, children under the age of 21, um, or a parent, the that process may only take a few months. Um, but if it is a, a brother or sister, um, the process of a family petition can take 10, 20, 15 years. Um, but with that said, if it is an urgent 
humanitarian uh, issue, um, you can also pursue humanitarian um, parole. Like we, we've talked about a few times here, but it's not, again, not a quick process. Nothing, the US government doesn't, or US immigration agencies don't work quickly. And we're working with, on advocacy to get them to work quickly, but there, there's not a lot of quick action to take. Um, additionally, if, if someone goes to a third country, they can seek refuge in the United States. Um, I've seen, I've, I've also was shared recently with some good resources for that, that if, if you have a relative who's going to go to a third country um, to seek refugee status, it's a good idea if they have letters of support from you, know your address and, and talk to the, the United Nations or whichever agency is doing their intake, and let them know that they have relatives here in the United States and that is where they, they want to go. Um, so that way early in the processing, they're aware that there, there are, is someone in the United States there that's willing to support them. Um, and, and those letters might contain you know, information about the kind of support you're willing to provide for your relatives, if you're willing to house them, um, you know, give them food and shelter, that kind of thing can all be really helpful to include in some kind of letter of support um, if your, your relatives are making that journey. Um, yeah, so the, the, the main things is a kind of a family petition or a um, refugee status, uh, depending if, 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 this, if you're not someone who's worked for the US government. So one of the one of the the the, the thread of questions I'm getting is um, I want to go to another country. Um, the caveat of that we all know if you're following the news um, that commercial flights have stopped. It's only the military planes that are going. The borders are close to other countries, and again, I'm coming from a, a practical place. And I, and, and I share the desperation and I'm not downplaying, but we gotta, we gotta look at the practicality of it. The whole country in Afghanistan, I mean, all the people in Afghanistan wanna get out. That's not gonna happen. If the borders open up at certain countries and they're taking it, for example, I know that India is doing a thousand or 10,000, I don't remember the numbers, e-visas, they're gonna be offering. You can't go to India right now because even if you get the visa, the airports are shut. Um, I'm hearing people saying, I wanna go illegally to another country. Morally and ethically, I can't advise that. If you think it's risk for you to go, there are checkpoints at every point. If you're coming, for example, from Jalalabad to Kabul, I know that there's at least 12 checkpoints. My green card holder clients were afraid to go through each checkpoints and I said, point blank. If you want to get out, that's the only thing we can do. Otherwise, you just stay in your house until things change. But remember also, for those who don't know, August 31st is the deadline of when the military is going to stop their operations. Unless the senators and the Congress meet and, and the legislature makes a decision to forward that a little bit longer, right now the date is August 31st. So a lot of the questions I get is I want to go to another country, either legally or illegally. Legally, right now, there's no options as we see this chaos at the airport. If it should open up in the next you know, week or two and they can get an e-visa to India or something like that. The second question I get a lot is, so-and-so told me they can get me out for $10,000. Highly unlikely that someone can get you out. That's just my humble opinion. And again, I'm not in that desperate situation, but I do feel it. So... If it's too good to be true, it's likely untrue. And there are going to be a lot of scammers. So you want to be careful with where you're investing not only the money, but the safety and security of your family members. The third question that I keep asking is, I have a lot of cases at USCIS. I just filed a month ago, a week ago, six months ago, eight days ago. If you want to fill out the repatriation form in the hopes that they get that and somehow they can get in, by all means, go ahead. But that form is intended for citizens, green card holders, and those um, that are documentarily ready at NBC. But we are also seeing that if those who didn't do any of that qualify, they're not screening that, they're letting people in. So again, for those who have petitions for their loved ones, Brittany can attest to this, there's no way to speed it up here. And even if you speed it up here and you get it to NBC, where is it going to process? The embassy, this, the U.S. embassy is closed. The fourth biggest question, uh, Brother Fayaz, I keep getting is, 
I need someone to escort my brother, mother, cousin, aunt, uncle, whoever it may be. I need them escorted by the US military to the airport. That is not going to happen. They haven't allowed that. There's no negotiation. There's no talk. There's not human manpower. And the US has not shown any interest in doing that. They may push the barrier further than where it is right now. As Brother Fias can say, you have the gate to get in, then you have a little area for where the Taliban are doing the screening. Uh, I believe, Brother Fias, you said that they're trying to push that further out so that people are not getting stampede. Um, so and I, someone called me about an hour ago and I happened to get the phone. And again, uh, there's only four of my paralegals and myself. Literally, wallahi, in the last, today alone, we've had about 450 calls. It's not, I, I'm trying to get to everybody that I can. What people want to know is, um, is there any way to get those people out and escort? Well, one of the callers I happened to pick up the phone was crying and said, her cousin and two brothers, Taliban came into the home and uh, one of the Taliban apparently wanted to shoot the cousin because he worked for the UN with medical supplies. The other Taliban didn't allow it, but they took him. Now the other two brothers are on the high going from home to home. Can you help me escort them? How can I escort them? How can we get someone to physically escort them when they're already in hiding? There's Taliban checkpoints. So I am, I'm not undermining the um, severity and, and the anxiety and how you guys are all feeling. But at this point, there's no options. And, and how much do we want to risk security? I think those are the two balances you have to do. So Brother Fayaz, those are the main questions that I'm getting. Okay, I have two questions uh, from Facebook. Uh, first question from Ed Kisam. Are there ways someone who does not have a password can get out of Afghanistan in order to get to a third country so as to apply under P2? So they don't have a passport, but they get out of Afghanistan or to get to a third country so they could apply for P2. Um, so I've heard that people can, but first logistic is getting to a third country right now or eventually, and you don't have a passport, um, I think that whatever country they go to are gonna understand the situation uh, to do the P2. But if you're talking about the P2 working with a nonprofit organization, what you're gonna have to do is reach the, the highest, reach whoever you can. So a perfect example was, I was gonna call somewhere else and the guy said, I work uh, for Save the Children or something. So. Yesterday at two o'clock in the morning, I was trying to go through my messenger and Facebook and someone said, hey, I work as a non, I work for the nonprofit Save the Children. Despite the lack of sleep, for somehow I remembered it. I quickly texted that person. I said, hey, you have an employee that reached out to me. Can you connect with them? And I'm humbled to be able to make that connection and I pray that somehow he gets it. So my point is for the P2, you gotta find the person in the high. So number one right now is safety. If you can get safety to another country, worry about the passport, worry about that stuff later. There will be a way eventually. Uh, I don't know what your take is on it, Brittany, but once you get out, you're gonna have to figure out how that organization is gonna meet, meet the P2 requirements. And they may get changed, they may not, but there are criteria for the P2. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are, Brittany. Yeah, and no, I think I think that's right. That yeah, do what you need to do for safety at the moment. Um, and yeah, we'll see. We'll get more information about the P two. Uh, one thing I will also flag is that the Taliban do have checkpoints at the different borders. So borders uh, that are going to Pakistan, Tajikistan, Iran, they're already uh, in control of uh, are being controlled by Taliban. So that's something to be very aware of, uh, Mr. Ed. All right, next question uh, from Omar Aziz. Apologies if this was already answered, but what's the likelihood of getting humanitarian parole for people who don't have affiliation working with the U.S. government? I think you you uh, hinted on this already, Brittany, but what if you want to reiterate what you mentioned? Yeah, so humanitarian parole is not limited to people who work for the U.S. government in any way. It's something that can be used for individuals from any country. Um, but what it is, is for people who have an urgent, exigent need to come to the United States. So what we typically see outside of this crisis is that it's granted for people who have an urgent medical need or they need to care for someone with a medical need, um, something like that. That's the scenarios where I've seen those requests be successful. Especially, I don't know if you have any other examples. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the humanity, uh, Assalamu alaikum, Omar John, this is Pajmai. Um, uh, nice to have you here. Um, so the humanitarian, pro, uh, the humanitarian pearl is not something new. I mean, people use it all the time. It's been used for, for, for many, many times. And you can have somebody who needs humanitarian pearl because they have an urgent surgery that they need and somebody can sponsor them here to do it. Uh, the Afghan crisis right now is a perfect example. The ways to procedurally work without getting to legalize is that you file the, the humanitarian parole with USCIS, US, uh, US uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services, and then they forward it to the State Department. And then if, when it, if it, I'm sorry, when you go to USCIS, it gets approved, it goes to the State Department, who then forwards it to the embassy. Well, we don't have an embassy in Afghanistan, so if a person can get to a third country, um, if they get to a third country, then they can definitely you know, work to get it to that embassy to be able to get the humanitarian parole. Hundreds of attorneys across the country, including the organization that Brittany mentioned, PARS, P-A-R-S, um, they, they're gonna be having a list of attorneys. So they are a small organization with a couple of attorneys, but what they've done is um, um, join the coalition with the American Immigration Lawyers Association, who are trying to find attorneys across the country on a list to volunteer and do the humanitarian paroles. If they get inundated with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of humanitarian parole, maybe Congress will take action on that. Um, I know one attorney, like I said earlier in the call, she had done it, um, but she can't get the client through the checkpoints to get it. So um, the logistics is, is you go through the process to get it, but then the procedural groundwork of getting in at the airport is the other challenge. So, so yeah, it's not limited to SIV, it could be anything, it could be um, any category, but especially the dire situation in Afghanistan right now. So if somebody gets to an XYZ country and they have somebody here in the US, an attorney that can help the humanitarian parole for them, um, even if they don't have a passport, even if they don't have travel documents, whatever, um, you know, they can coordinate with that embassy. And, you know, I've been practicing immigration law for almost 12 years. Uh, I don't know how long Brittany's been doing. I know that we went through the Muslim ban. Um, for me, not, not to be biased, I mean, the Muslim ban was just heartbreaking and devastating. I did a lot of those cases. Um, this crisis is on a different level. Um, and I, I'm sorry if I don't know if Brittany agrees or disagrees. It is so catastrophic that even the legal avenues that are there can't be pursued because of the logistics on the ground. That's the best way I can put it. Uh, thank you for pointing that out, Spojme. So I'm going to go back to a, a comment that a community member made, uh, and that's Haris Khan. He mentioned, uh, and I already answered the question, but I want to flag it for everybody. Uh, can you guys share a template? or what wordings to be included in a support letter for family members to apply through UNHCR. Uh, so that's something that we could definitely do on our end. And I already answered the question that we will inshallah have a template ready. Uh, also, Ayla most likely has those resources already, but on our end, we're going to make a concerted effort to provide that resource to the community, inshallah. The other question uh, that, uh, do, you have, do you have something to say, Spojme? Okay, okay. The other question uh, from Sister Zakia Raufi is with I-30, uh, we already applied in 2019. What are the next actions? They applied for an I-30 in 2019. What are the next actions? Uh, she's from a member of the Afghan community. Brittany, would you like me to answer or do you want to answer? Doesn't matter. I, I can I can I can go for that. So I'm assuming um, you mean I-130, which is the, a family petition. Um, so we can't answer, we can't give specific case advice here today. We can only give general advice. Um, and with that information provided, uh, it's hard to know exactly what where that case is procedurally, but kind of, I could talk about how the I-130 works and what the process that it follows. So um, an I-130 is first filed with immigration uh, USCIS here in the United States. And, and, and what an I-130 is is a petition for a, a relative. Um, and these can be filed by US citizens or lawful permanent residents uh, for relatives in certain specific categories. Um, the first step is to file that application with USCIS here in the United States. They will um, approve or deny the application typically within a year or two. Sometimes they take longer, um, sometimes it takes less time, uh, but that's just the first piece of the puzzle. Um, the case is then brought to 
the NVC, which we talked about a few times today, that's the National Visa Center. They're the ones that coordinate, uh, you know, bringing the case from immigration here in the United States to the consulate abroad. Uh, so NVC will then send the, the file to whatever consulate was designated when the application was filed. Um, in cases where it was Kabul, they will be reassigned somewhere. Um, and, and this is where the logistical uh, challenge comes in, right? Right now, if someone is in Afghanistan, where are they gonna to go to consular process? Um, but uh, the next step then would be to fill out a form with, with NBC and the consulate called the DS-260, which has similar information um, and gets into more detailed information about the, the applicant who would be emigrating to the United States. Um, and, and filing additional documentation and proof that they're of their eligibility. And this is where a background check is run and all of that kind of stuff. Um, eventually they would be called for an interview at the consulate where they would um, present their medical exam and their passport and their documents. And uh, a consular officer would make a decision on their, on their case and potentially give them a visa to come to the United States as a, um, a, a an immigrant uh, and essentially that have a green card upon arrival to the United States. Um, but it really varies on where your, your case is in that, that process and trajectory. Okay, there's two more questions that came in. Uh, one question deals with the I-130 again. Um, and this question comes from Mariam Aliomer, and that is, can we expedite the process of the I-130 for Afghan siblings in Afghanistan because of the situation there? My sisters and nieces are terrified, and it's not feasible to wait uh, for 13 years in this situation. So um, I wanted to add to what Brittany was saying on the I-130. So there's two categories. One is the immediate relative category, without getting too technical again, just so people understand. There's the preference, there's the immediate relative category. So in, in our world, we're thinking brother, sister, mother, and mother and father, and they're all like immediate relatives. In the immigration world, that's not how it works. In the immigration world, an immediate relative is your children under 21 and not married, your spouse and your parents. So when you file an I-130 petition for them, it goes through USCIS, you know, it takes eight to 10 months to get it approved. And then it goes to the National Visa Center, you do the rest of the work, and then it goes to the consulate abroad, schedule it for an interview. In the normal world, if it was Afghanistan, we're talking between uh, about a year and a half to two years from the time you file it with USCIS till you get an interview at the consulate. When you go to the preference category, that means, um, if, so again, I'm sorry, let me go back a step. If you're a citizen and you want to file an I-130, you can file it for your parents, your children are 21 and not married, um, and your spouse. So that, that goes through the way I said. If, uh, if you're a green, so if you are a citizen and you want to file for your brothers and sisters, they fall into the preference category, which means you can file the petition and maybe you'll get the petition approved within a year at USCIS, but then you're going to wait an average of eight to 12 to 27 years in the Philippines for that visa or India for that visa to become current at National Visa Center to process the case. To answer the question, no, there's no way to expedite it despite the situation we have going on. Now, if you're a green card holder, um, you get a green card holder. I get hundreds of these calls every month. No, I heard from my son, so you can. I'm going to be very clear. If you're a green card holder, you can only bring your children under 21 and not married or your spouse. You cannot file an I-130 for your parents. You cannot file a green card application for your parents. I want to reiterate that because a lot of new arrivals, particularly uh, new arrivals from, from Afghanistan, have misinformation, misunderstanding. Um, so no, you cannot file for your parents if you just filed your citizenship application. You must have your naturalization certificate to file for your parents. So if you're a citizen, you can file for your parents, your children under 21 and unmarried, or your, or your spouse, and you go through that whole process. If you're a citizen, you can also file for your siblings, but it's going to take years for that petition to become current. So no, under, under current situation, there's nothing that's been proposed to expedite those cases here. Please keep in mind and just look at the reality. We have US citizens stuck at the border. We have green card holders, we have translators, we have other people that they're desperately trying. So unfortunately, in the hierarchy of immigration world, right now at this moment, they haven't expedited those cases. Um, I've tried many times to expedite, Brittany, I don't know if you've ever tried. I haven't really had that much luck expediting in the past. 
Yeah, same. Yeah, expediting seems to to get nowhere with with USCIS. Um, I think uh, the other thing to mention. So this is where humanitarian parole might come into play. If your relative has a petition pending, but they also have a really urgent reason to be here, they're under you know an immense amount of danger. They have a major medical issue, whatever it is, that might be when humanitarian parole might come into play for them. So I'm sorry, Faz, I tend to go on a tangent explaining something. I hope it was helpful. But what was your question? Did I lost you? What was your No, question? no, no. You, you answered the question and then you answered uh, more than that, Hamdulillah. Okay. 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 So the next question, and I'm going to be um, kicking this to Sister uh, Brittany, and, and this deals with SIVs. Uh, from Jamal Nasser, he asks, Salam, uh, my, my brother's SIV case was denied. He, works, he worked for more than three years. Is he eligible for a visa? So I'm guessing he worked more than three years with the, with the company. Is he, is he eligible for a visa? Um, so this is where I'd, I'd recommend that you reach out to the um, International Refugee Assistance Project. They have thorough resources on, on, on denials, I believe, and, and provide direct assistance to individuals. Um, and it's possible if someone was rejected for the SIV that maybe they, they would qualify for the P2, um, the P2 Afghan process. So that would be another option to pursue. Because like um, Spojami just mentioned, the sibling-based family petition takes decades. <laughs> so that, that would, I'd recommend looking into the P2. Okay. And then the next question is from Zakia Nuri. Could you please say some information about my fiance's visa that got denied two weeks ago and says, if you want to reapply, respond back within 30 days. I don't know. Um I think there's more of a personal question, but... Well, I'll again. just answer in general, the process of when denials. Okay, yeah. So, so I don't know. So again, you know, like Brittany says, we're just keeping it general. Um, if they... So again, you first have to file the petition with USCIS. If it's approved, it goes to the National Visa Center for the rest of the processing, and then it goes to the consulate for an interview. So I don't know. I'm going to assume both. Let's assume that it got um, denied at the USCIS stage. They're going to send you a letter telling you why the petition was denied and it's likely due to some documentarily uh, a problem that wasn't done correctly. And it's very common. One thing I reiterate, and I'm one of those attorneys um, that I don't put fear into people. I think if you think you can do it, you can do it. Uh, if I was doing, I only do immigration law. If someone asked me to do something in family law, I wouldn't do it because I don't know anything about it. Doing these processes are very, very important to have an attorney do it. I know it's expensive and, um, you know, but they're doing it the right way. But if you got denial at a USCIS, uh, you know, call an attorney, you know, maybe pay a consultation fee and find out why it was denied. If it was, if it got approved at USCIS, you went to the National Visa Center, then your fiance or your husband had an interview and they got denied over there. Even though it got approved at USCIS, but it got denied over there for some reason because of fraud or because of national security or whatever it was, they will eventually kick it back to USCIS to give you a detailed denial letter. In the last few years, uh, Brittany, I don't know if you experienced my experience, I do a lot of these is sometimes you never get that denial letter and you're gonna to have to figure out why it was denied and try to reapply for the petition. So to answer your question, depending on which stage it was at, if it was at USCIS, you have a better chance, maybe it was documents, but if it was at the US Embassy after the interview, uh, you may potentially have some issues. Okay, thank you, Sister Spojme. So we're gonna to go to a question from the Zoom chat. I know you, you tried answering it, but then they had a follow-up question. I'll read the full question, the first question, and then the second question. Uh, Salam, uh, this is from MZ. Salam, I have a cousin in Pakistan as a refugee, but she is Afghan. She has a brain tumor and is very sick. Can we do the humanitarian parole route? She is 10 years old. The follow-up question was, uh, how do I start do I start the process here in the U.S. or do I uh, ha or does her parents have to start in Pakistan? So who wants to take this question? 
Well, the humanitarian pearl doesn't matter. I mean, Brittany Manigrisha can add more. I'm just going to let her talk, but I just wanted to say that the humanitarian pearl can be done anywhere. But if you're talking about medical, you're talking about possibly having someone sponsor them. Uh, because when you do the humanitarian pearl, you do have to do the financial documents to show that someone can support you here. If I'm not correct, Brittany, right? Uh, for the humanitarian pearl, you have to fill out the form I-134, the affidavit of yes. support. So if you're bringing someone in for medical, I'm assuming that you'd have to have someone that would cover the cost, like a hospital or somewhere in that documentation when you're asking for it. Uh, Brittany, I don't know what your take is. Yeah, that's right. Um, so the, the two ways to file for humanitarian parole um, is, is by filing form. So with USCIS here in the United States, by filing form I-131, an application for a travel document and requesting um, humanitarian parole through that route. Like uh, May just mentioned, that includes as well an affidavit of support, which is showing that someone here in the United States can financially support them. Um, if the person who's sponsoring them can't financially support them, you can also have a joint sponsor if there's someone else, another relative or family friend who, who wants to do that, um, that they would be committing to, to financially supporting. Um, a, another way is to apply at Customs and Border Protection. So if someone were to be at the border of the United States somehow, whether through plane or otherwise, um, they could request it there with Customs and Border Protection. But the most common way would be to apply through USCIS here in the United States. Um, so I, I also um, I shared a link in the chat here. I've shared it earlier. Um, this is a, a, a great kind of uh, scenario to bring to the to Parks Equality Center who is trying to match people with, with pro bono attorneys to assist them with these kind of applications because that is a very compelling story and the kind of case that I, I, I would see um, like hopefully inshallah moving through the process. Uh, thank you for answering that question. Uh, before we get into the next question that's being asked by Rita Asmai, I did want to flag uh, something that uh, Care California CEO mentioned uh, earlier, and that is uh, if you're from the Afghan community or, or any community in particular, in general, um, you may be getting visitations from the FBI, especially from the Af Afghan community. If you have the FBI visit you at your home or at work, please do not speak to them. Do not speak to them and make sure to let them know that you're being represented, uh, re represented by CARE and refer them to your local CARE chapter. So if you're in the Bay Area, refer them to CARE SFBA. If you're in the LA, Orange County, Inland Empire area, report, uh, refer them to CARE Greater Los Angeles. If you're in San Diego, refer them to CARE San Diego. And if you're in the Sacramento Central Valley area, refer them to CARE Sacramento. So again, if you're getting visited by the FBI at your work, or at home, do not speak to them. Make sure you refer them to your local care chapter, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, the other thing I wanted to flag before going, uh, going to the next question is uh, there, there are efforts on the advocacy side. We have a targeted action, an action alert. I know Sister Brittany and many individuals uh, that at CARE have been sharing on the various uh, uh, Facebook Lives. Please fill out the action alert. That way we you know, emphasize the importance of what? expediting the evacuation process, increasing the refugee cap by another 100,000. So that way we could, you know, safely bring uh, those that are asking for refuge in Afghanistan, inshallah ta'ala. So again, fill out the targeted action. It's been shared several times in the various Facebook live comment sections, and and it's, it's been shared several times in the webinar chat. So now we're going to go back to uh, Facebook. We have uh, two questions from Rita Asmai, and they're related to one question. Uh, Salam for the State Department evacuation request form. If the applicant has an Afghan passport and pending case with USCIS, but not a U.S. passport, is it accepted? And the following follow-up question was, also, if a family sponsor case was denied by USCIS, what are the options and next steps? Are they eligible for any current visas? So again, uh, for the department, uh, uh, the State Department evacuation request form, if the applicant has an Afghan passport and pending uh, U.S. passport, is it accepted for them to fill out the form? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what they mean by pending U.S. passport. Um, I would assume that means that someone who is a U.S. citizen but has not obtained their passport. 
So I, um, I'm I'm assuming <laughs> that this person is not a U.S. citizen, but has an Afghan passport, but does not have a U.S. passport. So they're not can, U.S. citizens. I mean, you you can have dual citizenship. Yeah, I, but I mean, before you get it, so before you can get a U.S. passport, you have to be a green card holder. So uh, the question is con- confusing. I mean, if they fi- if they have an Afghan passport and stuff, family member filed for them, and that petition got denied for whatever reason, legally they're not permitted. But with all this chaos going on, if they're able to somehow get through the airport, they may come in. But in a traditional world. Uh, you have to have a petition filed by someone so that you can do it correctly and then be able to migrate to the U.S. You're not going to get in without having some sort of a, an immigrant visa filed on your behalf. Yes, uh, bear with me. I, I'm trying to read through the text. I, I'm trying to go through like grammatical issues also. So the next question is also if a, if a family sponsor case was denied by USCIS, what are the options and next steps? Are they eligible for any current visas? So I think the thing to look at if someone has their case denied by USCIS uh, is the reason. So uh, USCIS has to provide an explanation when they deny an application. So you would need to look at that. Um, generally, when there's a denial, I, w- I would advise you as well to speak to an immigration attorney who could help you uh, figure out if that is something that can be overcome. Sometimes it's that you didn't provide enough, the, enough evidence, um, or sometimes the person's not eligible for some reason. And so it would it really varies circumstance to circumstance. Um, and, and you want to look at that reason for the denial. Um, and, and I'd recommend bringing it to an immigration attorney and having them um, assess whether it's something that, that you could overcome or something that is, you know, something that person is not able, maybe they weren't qualified. Um, but you can, you know, in, in some cases you may be able to reapply and, and there are appeal periods um, shortly after when a decision is made, you may be able to appeal with USCIS in some cases um, and they may be eligible for a different kind of visa, but that is something you would need to do a, um, an individual consultation with an immigration attorney to find out. Okay, we're going to go to the next question uh, from Zakia Raofi, and then we're going to go to the webinar questions also. I know there's uh, two questions pending there, so please be patient with us. Uh, the question is, what can I do to take my sister out of Afghanistan? Her life is in danger. She is, in a, she is a single mom with disabled son and teenage daughter. I'm so disappointed and helpless. I applied for the I-130 uh, for her in 2019, but it takes 15 years. Any suggestions, please? I mean, this is a heartbreaking situation, but I will leave it to the attorneys to answer. So you can certainly, so uh, two things, you can certainly fill out the, there's not much guidance on that P3 category, the family reunification. So again, it's not very clear on what the family reunification is going to entitle, and they haven't even you know, released any guidance on how we're supposed to do that. That's one of the questions Ayla has asked. Um, you know, certainly, you know, there's a form that's filled out, and if you guys have the resources on the P program, the form that gets filled out, um, I haven't done it yet because the logistics were not clear in it, so I apologize, but I would say if you can do the P3, the application to fill it out, or maybe we'll get some more information in the coming weeks, because that is one of the questions that has been asked. Um, And maybe CARE can put it on their site. Um, You know, you can try the P3 uh, family reunification. Now, these options that we're talking about are due to the crisis that's going on. But one question I want to answer is, and I'm going back to the question we asked before is, I'm a US citizen. And I want to bring my mother and my father and my two, three siblings, one sibling, whatever. Keep in mind earlier what I said. Your parents are your immediate relatives. Your siblings, even if they are under age 21, they are your preference category, which means, and it's heartbreaking. I've seen this happen many, many times where people filed it themselves or they filed it with someone who didn't know what they were doing. They have the expectation that I'm a citizen. I filed for my mom, dad, my two younger brothers and sisters. They will never come together under the real world of immigration. I'm not talking about what's happening now. There are certain uncertainties. But prior to the process, what happens is is mom and dad, and I've had many clients, dozens of clients. I don't know, Brittany, if you have. But 
I file for mom and dad. I get the mom and dad here. And then either mom or dad go back home every six months. When mom and dad get here and they get their green card, that child is their immediate relative. So they can file for the child to come in. And that could take two to three years to bring in that child. But unfortunately, in the world of immigration, there is no, where, there's no area to, to, to bypass that. Right now, if you wanted to file, I think P3 is the only option. Unless, Brittany, you have any other thoughts? If they get to another country and maybe they can do humanitarian parole or asylum or, so, or something else that might come in the future. But that's all I can think of. Yeah, that's right. I think the other options would be pursue yeah, refugee status or asylum status or humanitarian parole in some cases. Okay, folks, we're going to take the next three. These are going to be the last three questions before we close out the program. For specific cases, I would highly recommend you all to call your local care chapter. Uh, we do have the resource link we've posted several times at the bottom of the resource link uh, that we have posted uh, is a number and email to each one of the care chapters throughout California, inshallah. So the next question is going to be, the next two questions are going to be from our webinar. And this question is from uh, Safiya. Salams, thank you for holding this session. How can I help expedite my uncle's SIV application? We had applied prior to the current situation. I have his case number and all documents. Is there a way I can obtain his status or any information? So my recommendation to anyone um, seeking assistance with the SIV process is to reach out to International um, Refugee Assistance Project, again, IRAP. Um, they really specialize in this area and provide uh, free assistance where they can, and I'm sure we'll hopefully be getting additional resources, but I know they were, they're also probably inundated, but they also, um, I'll link their website again, but they do have a list of resources that you can re review for some self-help, but then also seek their assistance. And then the next question is from MZ. Uh, my brother has a pending SIV case, but he is still waiting. How can I help him as a U.S. citizen so the process is expedited? I think this basically was sort of answered last time, but uh, I'll give it back to Sister Sposhman. So, so Brittany, you said, are you talking about SIV cases? This is an SIV case. How can we expedite the process and how can we support as a U.S. citizen? So, I mean, um, there's one organization called No One, I'm putting in the chat, No One Left Behind. Um, and they have funding. I just spoke with an attorney before I got the panel. They're actually, they're not sharing that information, obviously, because security reasons. It's called No One Left Behind. The founder is a guy named John and Shanwari, who, who I know. Um, they're working frantically to get people out. Um, I think that's a better way to go than, than to try to expedite it because that process is a little bit chaotic, chaotic right now. I'm going to, so that the sources that I'm listing for everyone, um, they have been verified, they are legitimate, and, but I don't want to, someone hold me to the information. I'm gonna share this in, in right here in the chat box because I don't think it's on the care. I got this from a reliable source within, within AILA it's an evacuation um, you can try, it's not guaranteed. It's a document you fill out to try to get, and I haven't done it, I have, I've looked at it just briefly. Um, you can click on it, it's to get people evacuated. The other person you wanna reach out for, for, so again, we're talking about getting people out, not through the process of expediting the process because it's backlogged and it's impossible, but other means of getting people out that are SIV. Uh, Tom Cottons, Senator, he's a senator, if you want to Google, sorry, I don't have his number. He has put in planes and stuff in place to evacuate translators and other people. So reach out to Tom Cotton, Senator. That link that I just sent you, you can try that. Um, the other one was Brother Fayaz, the one that you put about um, the repatriation form. You can do that. And then also, um, if you're in local, you can reach out to off uh, to Congressman um, Eric, sorry, I can't talk and type at the same time. Eric Swalwell. I just, I just included a link to Jennifer where you can Nolan find Dog. your. Uh, Brittany, do you have any other sources people can look at? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, if you're a U.S. citizen, uh, I recommend you reach out to your direct, your Congress member, so whoever's representing you in the House or the Senate. Um, 
And I, I put a link where you can put your zip code in and find out who that is if you don't already know who it is. Um, like Spoja I mentioned, if you live in, Fre in Fremont, it's likely Congressman Eric Swalwell. Um, but they, most offices we've heard from, their immigration staff is focused on supporting people from Afghanistan. And they have a lot of tools and power to, to move things. Um, and so really recommend that you reach out to them uh, in any scenario if you're concerned about uh, a relative. Here's another legitimate source. Again, legitimate meaning that it's real. If there's a lot of fake stuff going on. And again, this came within AILA, my AILA sources. If you're trying to evacuate any family member or even, you know, SIV, it says uh, email carter.mcalkin, whatever, that, it's all there. Um, you can contact their office. So these sources that I'm giving you, the two that I gave you, um, uh, you know, these sources in the repatriation, um, you know, Tom Cotton, Senator, he's been big on the news trying to get people. Uh, do you know in, in, in the uh, South Bay, uh, anybody focusing on the, I know Congressman Eric Swalwell here in the East Bay is, uh, you know, taking his contingency. Do you know of any other people that, I mean, uh, Faye, Brother Faye is a, uh, Diane Feinstein's office, Pelosi's office, any other? Yeah, yeah. So today I, I I met with Diane Feinstein's office and they do have uh, resources now. They have a hotline a number that folks can call. I could definitely share that, inshallah, and, and an email. But one thing that they wanted to emphasize was it all goes to the same um, Google form or what have you. So whether it's a U.S. senator or a House member, it all goes to the same pool and sent to the State Department just to let you all know. So it's not like the senator is going to have like some special sway uh, in this process. The other thing that they mentioned, the, the, the reason why I would, I would prefer to go with the U.S. senator is not because they're going to have some special sway. Again, they, they, they don't. It's because it's going to make it easier for us as community members to just email a U.S. senator because no matter where you live in California, they represent you, so you don't have to find your uh, representative in your specific house district. So that's something that's very helpful. We'll definitely share those resources for the community. We have one more question on Facebook. This is going to be the last question. Um, again, I emphasize I've posted several times in the different uh, chat groups on the live uh, Facebook lives and in the um, uh, webinar chat, uh, the resource page and uh, that Care California is providing. Thank you, Sister Brittany and others that helped. Uh, create that resource page and the bottom of the resource page has a number and email of your local care chapter please email and call those numbers uh, to get help on your specific cases inshallah so this last question inshallah from facebook is coming from sister mariam ali and she asks my family is a refuge uh, are refugees in india for nine years they are registered with unhcr uh, but their case is not moving. What are their options and which countries are accepting refugees from India? There was a list. If I can find it shortly, Brittany, if you want to talk, I can quickly find it. There, There's a list on Ayla. I'm going to look if you want to. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, that is one of the, the big issues, like all of these processes take many, many, many years and, um, resettlement agencies on the ground in third countries are, are working with thousands and thousands of, of refugees. And so it is something that can take decades in some cases for, for someone to be resettled. Um, but yeah, let's, um, we, another thing as well, is, so um, one recommendation is to get in touch with, if there's a, depending on where you're located, there are likely refugee resettlement agencies in your area, and maybe you can get in touch with them and let them know that you're interested in sponsoring this person. Um, because there, there's always a, a refugee resettlement partner who would be helping settle that, uh, that person in the United States. And so those agencies include um, Catholic Charities, Jewish Family Services, International Rescue Committee. Um, and so you can reach out to them to see if there's any way that you can, can provide support or that they could, could provide support for your relative. Um, and most of these agencies are, are national and, and, and have local offices all around the country. So I'm trying to find the AILA advisory that um, was listing some of the potential countries. And I wish I had done this earlier. Um, um, oh, I think. 
there was a list of countries that people could potentially go to, but the question right now is, is that um, nobody, nobody's able to get out of anywhere. I'm sure we'll be able to have the list. Um, and there's like, you know, there were like Ghana, Senegal, India, you know, there, there were a few countries that people could possibly go to. Um, but right now, because there are no evacuations, there are no flights going out anywhere, it'll be difficult for anybody to, um, to utilize that. So the question was, where can people go? At this point, there's no place people can go. Um, but eventually, if this does evacuate our allies. Uh... Well, the, the question the person had was, they are, they are already in India. Oh, they're already in India. Yeah, they're not. They're not. They're not evacuating. They are. They already got to India, and they've been there for nine years. Uh, they are registered with UNHCR, but okay. their case is not moving. Uh, what are their options, and which countries are accepting refugees from India? Okay, so at this point, I mean, you have to work. I, I'm not from too familiar with UNHCR, which country they designate. I mean, it could take years for people to get through that system. Uh, do you have more? So sorry, I was trying to find the countries people can possibly migrate to. Rather. Yeah, I mean, that's an important thing to find out also. Yeah, there were some countries that were listed, but we'll, that'll probably get expanded and I'll share it. Uh, uh, if people want to follow my, my Facebook or follow CARES resources, um, uh, law office, my page, I'm going to try to put as much as I can that I get. But yeah, Brittany, do you have more information on that? I'm not familiar too much with that. Well, I think I think the one thing to add is uh, this is why it's so important to, uh, the advocacy pieces that, that Brother Fayez mentioned that the refugee cap. So part of the reason so few refugees come to the United States is because there's they only accept so many per year, which has been very limited, particularly in the past five years. Um, so really encourage you to sign our action alert asking. Um, this administration to increase the cap of for refugees so that more refugees can come to this country and hopefully prevent people from being in refugee camps for nine plus years. Um, yeah, I think that's my, my big recommendation on that one. Okay, uh, and just, just to flag something for the community, uh, during the last year of the Trump administration, I met, mentioned this in the beginning of the webinar, uh, the refugee cap was only at 15,000, which was like the lowest ever. And just to let you know, it's not like they have the refugee cap at 15,000. They're going to accept 15,000. They never accept the full refugee cap number. It, it would, they always accept maybe about 70%, maybe 80% if you get real lucky. So and they'll put the designation at 15,000. They might accept 12,000, maybe. Um, but again, this, this cycle, it's at 62,500. And that is why we're advocating for the community to fill out the action alert, inshallah ta'ala, uh, to increase that refugee cap by another 100,000. So we get it to 160,000, uh, 62,500, inshallah ta'ala. That way we could get more refugees, uh, especially from the Afghanistan region, uh, to get refuge here in the U.S., inshallah ta'ala. With that being said, is there any closing remarks from the other panelists? And then we will close, uh, inshallah. So I just wanted to go to, you know, first of all, I know we pray for our, for our fellow Muslims, fellow Afghans, and the situation is dire. And, you know, everybody's frantically trying to reach out to anybody they can. I would just say, um, and I know, again, it's easier said, and please uh, respect what I'm saying in the sense that it's not that it's dire, it's just that the situation doesn't have the opportunities for people to get out. Um, if they can just stay still at their homes and stay safe, um, but if they're able to get through some of the avenues that we've all talked about, do take those with the caveat that there are dangers involved. Um, second of all, you know, who, you know um, I say this with, with bitterness. Um, we have what we have. We have the Taliban. That, that's our government. Um, I'm sure you are all, your heart was aching when the flag of Afghanistan got replaced. Sorry to get, and you know, the, so I'm saying that, sorry. We, you, you, we have to look at the reality. Not everyone's going to get out. Please just, if your family members are there and they're okay, just tell them to stay safe and see what happens in the future. Um, if the you know, commercial errands go, people can get visas to other countries. We're hoping that those other countries will have 
some sort of a humanitarian asylum program for people. Uh, you know, the Taliban are saying one thing in the front, but we're, I'm personally seeing the actions. Many of your family members are probably sharing with you what they're seeing. So uh, just just be cautious. And, and, and again, there are not many options. And someone told me, well, I'm just going to call the next lawyer. And I said, OK, that's fine. Go ahead. Um, there are not many options, regardless of which lawyer you call at uh, this point. And the last thing I would say is there are a lot of scammers, and Fayez John, I'm sure you can attest to this. Uh, please be careful where your family are spending the money, because even if they're going to get from point A to point B in between our Taliban checkpoints, and just look at it realistically. And, and I pray not only for, for, for all of us, but Afghanistan and our country, and, and try to be hopefully optimistic. And thank you for joining us, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Bojami. It's hard to follow that up, but I think it just to be hopeful, I want to encourage us all to reach out to our, our elected officials, our Congress members, sign the action alerts, show up at protests, whatever it is you can do, support organizations on the ground, make donations for, for aid agencies um, to support people however we can. The U.S. immigration system is slow and moves moves very slowly, but um, I know there's a lot of really passionate immigration attorneys out there willing and, and wanting to help Afghan people. Um, and we will do what we can advocacy-wise, but we need everyone's support. So please, please continue to take those advocacy steps that we've um, outlined today. We can't hear you. Yeah, I have, like, I have like three microphones. So, Okay, so as Sister uh, Brittany was mentioning, uh, please fill out the action alert. That's really, really important. This way, our members of Congress and the president and vice president know that we are concerned about uh, the people of Afghanistan. And we want to make sure that we get as many people safely here to the U.S. as possible, inshallah. And finally, again, as our, our CEO at CARE California, Brother Hossam al mentioned, uh, if you have members of the FBI visit you at work or at your home asking you questions, please do not talk to them. Please make sure to refer them to your local care chapter, inshallah ta'ala. You're not obligated to speak to them, and they will use anything you say uh, against you, and you want to make sure that you have representation, inshallah. So please, again, please, please, please contact your local care chapter and refer them to them. Say, hey, look. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to speak right now. Please talk to my uh, attorney at CARE San Francisco, CARE San Diego, CARE Sacramento, CARE LA. Alhamdulillah, we have representation up and down the state in our wonderful chapter, uh, our one wonderful satellite office at Central uh, Valley. Alhamdulillah. So again, uh, thank you for all joining the web uh, webinar. We tried our best to answer as many questions as we could. We almost answered questions for 45 minutes. Alhamdulillah. Please refer to the earlier portion of the webinar. This webinar is recorded. If you have family or friend that really need this information, please share this webinar with them. That way they could see it through. If you have further questions, please contact your local care chapter. We shared the, uh, the resource page several times. At the bottom of the resource page, we have the emails and the numbers of each one of the care chapters and their immigration uh, numbers, inshallah, so uh, immigration line. So please contact your local care chapter. I know it's time for Maghrib coming up very soon. So I look forward to making wudu and praying my Maghrib, inshallah. May Allah Ta'ala bless you all. May Allah keep your family and friends safe. Uh, may Allah Ta'ala forgive all of our sins and bless all of you. Jazakum Allah khair.